Hi, I'm Dave, and I'm a repairs volunteer at Derby Computer Museum. Much of what Derby Computer Museum has on display for visitors has been kindly donated, and they're lucky enough to have a family computer on the show floor right now. We can see from this label that back in 2023, this particular Famicom was diagnosed as not functional and with a rather concerning message that the CPU is dead. And if that turns out to be true, then sourcing an authentic replacement CPU for a console that hasn't been made in almost 30 years could present a bit of a challenge. The back of the console speaks to the time in which it was made. Uh, standard televisions commonly featured a single RF input from a TV aerial. Uh, which the console shared via a splitter cable, hence the TV game switch. We can also see the AC adapter, which is where we'll first focus attention to ensure the console actually powers on. And this is where we see our first red flag. Um, while this is an official Nintendo Entertainment System transformer, it is designed for the UK, which has AC current, while Japan uses DC. It's, um, it's unfortunately possible then that the console has at some point been subjected to a power overload. Anyway, uh, let's take a look inside. Um, the back of the case is very simple to remove, just a standard Phillips screwdriver is needed. Um, and the Famicom came in multiple revisions, it was in manufacture for 10 years. Um, this particular revision comes as two separate parts, the, the motherboard and the separate PCB for the power regulator and AV output. Uh, they are connected by a short length of flex cable to carry the signals and voltage to the components. Once disassembled, this layout can be rather awkward to work with as the ribbon is fragile and soldered in place rather than in via removable connectors such as is used for the two controllers. Um, likely why that design was revised in later editions. Um, let's focus firstly on the power circuit. The circled component here connects to the mains power adapter which as we've established must be 9 volt and DC. So if using in the UK, then the original plug with a step down converter is usually a must have. However, the console actually only needs five volts of DC power in order to operate. This is handled via a voltage regulator, which takes in the mains input and supplies the required five volts. This uh, shot shows the underside of the voltage regulator. And the important point to note is that the mains power and voltage regulator pass current via thin wire, which you can perhaps make out. Um, here it is not in fact soldered in place, meaning it won't reliably perform as a complete circuit. So out came the soldering iron as no power, no working console. That fragile ribbon cable I mentioned earlier simply came away as anticipated after 30 years, 40 years of misuse. Um, exposing the tiny strands of wire remaining that are essential to forming the bridge for the two PCBs to communicate. Wire strippers and once again the soldering iron were needed to make sure this was fixed back firmly into place. And testing with a multimeter provided proof that the correct level of power was being carried across the board. So it's time to take a closer look at the upper side of the motherboard. The Famicom is relatively speaking a Pretty simple design. Uh, some of the key integrated circuits we need to examine include the system RAM, which comes in two blocks, the address decoder, which helps the CPU determine which IC to send or receive data from, uh, the picture processing unit, which these days we'd call a GPU, uh, and finally the CPU itself. It's, um, it's always a good idea to check the area around the component that's been found to be faulty, uh, which is where my eye was drawn to this area of the power circuit. What uh, looks like a rotten apple with a cigarette stubbed out in it is a clear warning sign of damage or corrosion to this trimmer capacitor, um, as is the adjacent gunk on which should be shiny traces linking these crucial components. The soldering iron was once again called into action to remove these components. And so we can see quite clearly that residue and discoloration which will at best impede or worse prevent the optimal transfer of data and power for the CPU to operate properly. Capacitor leakage is a common issue affecting electronic devices from the 80s and 90s. And this schematic identifies clearly what they are and what the rating and resistance should be. 
95% proof alcohol and a toothbrush can gently remove the corrosion and expose what fortunately appear to be undamaged traces and vias, and to then fit new capacitors in all the key areas to prevent further leaking of damaging fluid. With further multimeter tests, we can at this point be reasonably assured that this obvious power, continuity, corrosion and component issues have been addressed. And so we return to the diagnosis of dead CPU and how to go about testing one way or another if it's still an issue. Original Famicom spare parts are exceptionally difficult to come by in the UK. Uh, fortunately, the museum seems to have made friends around the world, but we were still pretty gobsmacked to receive three original boards direct from Hong Kong, where they can still be found. One of these we nicknamed Miracle, as in spite of its rusty, grotty condition, it worked without so much as a basic clean. And this was pretty crucial in providing a reliable model to test against when diagnosing the cause of our dead console. Another extraordinary stroke of luck was acquiring the loan of a thermal camera, something way out of our budget, but could be of enormous help in quickly visualising how the two boards react when under load. This side-by-side -side illustrates the heat signature when functioning correctly. We can see a healthy indicator of key components like the regulator, RAM, PPU and CPU. However, when we run the same test against our faulty console, the results are dramatically different. Only one heat signature appears clearly identified as the CPU. More worrying is when we look at the actual temperature being generated. Our potentially faulty CPU is quickly reaching almost double that of the Miracle console. So we know the CPU gets power. What it also needs is a method to regulate the timing at which it operates. This is supplied by the, the clock crystal. So we need to check the crystal is resonating at the correct frequency and that it's supplying the CPU with that information. I strongly recommend the excellent Inside the Famicom series by What's Ken Making. Link to his channel is in the comments. It's from this we obtained this illustration of what's going on between the clock and the CPU. We can see on the right that the operating frequency on a healthy component should be 21.5 MHz and that it should be measurable on pin 29 of the CPU. If that's functioning correctly, then the modified 6502 processor in the Famicom uses an internal divider within the CPU that should result in it outputting a frequency of 1.9 MHz to the other components, like the PPU, via pin 31. And this is essential to ensuring messages passed between the integrated circuits don't get out of sync. So now we know what we're expecting, let's use our oscilloscope to determine whether or not the CPU is getting the correct input signal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Twenty-one point five megahertz, which is what clock in should be. Which is what we were hoping for. So let's see if we get the desired output of one point seven nine megahertz on pin thirty-one. Go two to the right four o'clock out and again only voltages on the ones that work this is where you get a clock out so this is the confirmation we needed that the internals of that cpu are not correctly dividing the signal and passing it on which is a pretty solid indicator of an internal failure we have three motherboards from which to harvest a donor cpu one miracle works and is best left alone the second displays a healthy heat trace, but no picture or sound, so with a little work might well be a valuable spare working console. Finally, we have this one, which shows evidence of having caught fire and the power ribbon completely missing, likely owing to critical damage at some point in its life. On the downside, it means without work, it can't be even be tested, but as a donor, it's the obvious place to start. The CPU is soldered to the board via 40 separate pins. Um, in removing them one at a time, it's imperative that the pads to which the solder is bonded don't get damaged in the process. Since it's a through-hole component, uh, rather than a SMD or surface-mounted IC, we need to work from the underside. While very time-consuming, the process went extremely smoothly and the board suffered no damage. Uh, with a little extra flux, IPA alcohol and toothbrush, 
The pads are in remarkably good shape to receive the socket we're installing, just to make it easier to test other CPUs if this one is also faulty. The upper side was in a pretty filthy state with residue having collected out of sight, but again a little careful cleaning made it ready for the socket to be fitted. And here it is. The socket has to be soldered into place, but thereafter the donor CPU removed from the donor board, again laboriously and with extreme care, can gently be snapped into place. And now it's time to test. Okay, new CPU fitted. So a lovely steady 5.19 volts, which is much better than the old one. I'm now going to try clock in, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Clock in is a steady 21.5 megahertz. Two to the right, 31. 1.79 megahertz. And guess what? It's not even hot. As mentioned earlier, the Famicom isn't capable of connecting to a UK television without modification, including physical adaptation of the shell itself to enlarge the old RF hole in order to install a four pole, three and a half millimeter female jack socket. The four poles referred to are the metal tabs to which wires for video, audio and ground can be attached to the amplifier board that will help deliver the clearest composite video signal possible, as well as removing noise of more basic modifications, such as notorious jail bars. An additional electrolyte capacitor is also necessary as part of bridging the audio out data pin on the cartridge connector with the amplifier board. And here we can see the now complete video and audio circuit, linking the amplifier board not just to the video pole and the AV out jack, but also pulling a signal directly from the video out pin of the picture processing unit. In addition, two ceramic capacitors are wired to connect the video out signal from the PPU and the power or VCC pin on the CPU with ground. With the console finally reassembled, it's the ultimate test. Has all the work been worthwhile? Been idling for like 40 minutes while I've been cleaning up. And there we have it. The diagnosis of bone CPU is correct. Although a number of other essential maintenance tasks are necessary to make it fully functional, we were exceptionally lucky to be gifted replacement parts from such a generous fan in the museum. And it was a happy moment to finally see it back where it belongs, hooked to a CRT television, ready for another 40 years. <laughs>